I want to live in? I think about this question a lot. For our generation and for specifically my group of people, which is refugees, the circumstances might dismantle any vision of the future that we have. You're trying to rebuild, you're trying to make a future for yourself, and then the climate related disaster comes and you start again. It's not about how it's affecting you now, it's about how it's affecting you your entire life. First step to understand is that we're all a part of it. None of us are going to be left out by the crisis. We're at a stage where if we don't act now, really there won't be very much left. There are generations that will never see certain things that we grew up seeing in real life. We have to start treating this like the emergency it is. To achieve the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we have to go from an intention to a serious commitment. Business leaders really need to rethink how they conduct their business and invest in creating systems that are climate friendly. Action I would like to see is accountability. Structures being put in place where countries aren't just asked to do something, but they're kept accountable to the decisions that they make. There has to be that strong collaboration between government, between corporations, between youth activists to drive change forward. The world I would want to live in is a world where imagining the future is not a privilege. I want to live in a world where people do not give up on hope, hope that a positive change is possible. The fact that you're listening today means that you are willing to make a change. Good morning, good afternoon. Structural factors of diverse nature continue to hinder the sustainable development potential in Central American nations. Responsible investments, good governance, and innovative public-private collaboration are key to effectively tackle economic, social, security, and environmental challenges, as it is also important to build local capacities for the long term in order to address root causes that have triggered high migration flows, particularly from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. As it is of fundamental importance to ensure a humanitarian treatment of migrants and to protect and respect their human rights, it is also critical to understand the circumstances they're fleeing from to develop adequate responses to resolve them in their own home countries. Various business and civil society leaders joined the United States Vice President's call to action last May, resulting in a comprehensive public-private strategy that would involve the commitment of local and international resources to support the region's efforts for its long-term progress. The World Economic Forum participated in the call to action and it's contributing particularly in seeking ways to catalyze economic opportunities. Today's conversation aims to identify and scale up opportunities and build local capacities for the long term, highlighting the importance of establishing public-private partnerships for Central America, mainly focused on creating inclusive and sustainable economic opportunities, building a skilled workforce for better remunerated jobs, and leveraging the Forum's Fourth Industrial Revolution Technologies Network to accelerate social and economic development. We're very pleased to have with us today Salvador Biguria, a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader alumnus from Guatemala, Jonathan Fantini Porter, is the Executive Director of the Partnership for Central America. Guillaume Lecunf is the Chief Executive Officer of Nestlé Nespresso SA, Switzerland. Emily Mandrala is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State of the United States Government. And Maria Liliana Moore is the Director of Strategic Partnerships and Development of ProMujer. This session is on the record and is being webcasted. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Salvador, let me begin with you. 
and your capacity as a Central American leader from the private sector, but also actively involved in civil society, could you provide an overview of the Central American context and the root causes of migration from our own region's perspective? Salva, I think your mic is muted. Got it. Thank you. Got it. No. Thank you, Marisol and the Forum, for this opportunity. I am sure many of you have heard about our country's context and root causes of migration, so I'll be brief. Although our countries have maintained stable economies over the last 20 years, economic growth has been insufficient and not inclusive enough to close the big income gaps that exist. The result has been a significant proportion of our populations are still unsuccessfully seeking jobs or income generating opportunities. At the same time, we continue to have a very weak government institutions provided limited coverage of the most basic public services, such as education, healthcare, clean water and sanitation, and transportation. Corruption has been at the front and center of the weakening of our institutions, and the latest COVID-19 pandemic has evidenced just how far these weaknesses go. In addition, as, as the World Risk Report recognizes, our Northern Triangle countries are some of the most at risk of multiple disasters, such as uh, hurricanes, flooding, volcano eruptions, and earthquakes. And we have also some of the weakest capacities to react to some of these uh, disasters. Uh, lastly, without going too much into a matter, there is the impact of drug trafficking and organized crime in the region. So adding all of this up and, and to exemplify, if you were, for example, a farmer in the Guatemala's Western Highlands, it is very likely your children are more chronically malnourished. You have very limited access to educational healthcare. Your home region is surrounded by drug traffickers and the agricultural products you produce are not very competitive to be sold in the local or export markets. And if a hurricane or a natural disaster would come by and uh, eliminate your harvest, what would be the logical alternatives for somebody in that position? Hence migration. And to make matters more complicated, a migration provides a feedback loop through the huge flow of remittances, increasing the incentive, incentives for people to risk the journey north. And these incentives have continued to be increased in the United States, while the incentives to remain have not. To not close in such a grim note, uh, we must notice that our countries are still blessed with many natural resources. We are ideally placed in the backyard of the world's biggest market with access to both coasts and also with a trade agreement in place. Uh, we have world-class tourist destinations, extremely hardworking people and population sizes that allow for impact, impactful projects to scale in short periods of time. It is in the middle of this gap between the reality of our countries and the opportunities we have in front of us that the call to action, the Partnership for Central America and the World Economic Forum's efforts can be transformative forces catalyzing international resources and bringing best in class solutions to partner with local actors to change our, current, our country's current reality. Thank you. Thank you, Salvador. Thank you for that a brief overview that describes quite well the situation in Central America. Emily, you also bring a notable understanding of the region and a notable experience on migration issues. What is the United States government's vision, purpose, and the scope of the United States Vice President's call to action that it was shared in May of 2021, a few months ago? Thank you so much, Marisol, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. Thanks to the World Economic Forum for convening all of us to talk about economic development that is equitable, inclusive, and sustainable. I think it is clear to all of us here that none of us alone can create conditions needed to lift up Central America. The U.S. government's diplomatic engagement and foreign assistance are useful tools but are not enough for lasting equitable growth that will give Central Americans the hope they need to build a future at home. The region needs broad private sector investment and job growth. Simply put, it needs partners like all of you. The U.S. government recently released our new root causes strategy for Central America. The strategy identifies, prioritizes, and coordinates government actions to improve conditions in the region. The strategy has five pillars 
each of which reinforces the other. Pillar one, addressing economic insecurity and inequality. Pillar two, combating corruption, strengthening democratic governance and advancing the rule of law. Pillar three, promoting respect for human rights, labor rights and a free press. Pillar four, countering and preventing violence, extortion and other crimes perpetrated by criminal gangs, trafficking networks and other criminal organizations. And pillar five, combating sexual, gender-based and domestic violence. Generally, people think of private sector engagement fitting exclusively into the first pillar about addressing economic insecurity and inequality, but I think we all understand that the private sector benefits from improvements in governance, pillar two, and security, pillar four, and has a direct impact on labor rights, pillar three. In addition, positive change in one area can create positive change in the others. The current political and economic systems in each country exist and function the way they do because they benefit people in power. All too often, that means many Central Americans are excluded from realizing their own potential. Small businesses aren't given the opportunity to grow. Marginalized communities find it hard to access business financing, for example. If we want to affect change, we need to change these incentive structures. It's not a small task, and it's one that requires a united front to make real change. As organizations invest in Central America, they help expand economic opportunity, but those investments can also be leveraged to advocate for critical governance reforms. The U.S. government, the private sector, and civil society can and should have a unified message when we advocate for investment climate reforms in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras. And we should be specific when we talk about tangible benefits governance reforms would bring. Additionally, the private sector can make moves that quickly impact the economic system. You have the economic power to isolate corrupt actors in business and the private sector and choose to only partner with companies that are good actors. This could range from ceasing partnership with corrupt actors to ending contracts with factories that exploit workers to expanding efforts to, small, to support small entrepreneurs. This real movement of dollars away from bad actors to support non-corrupt actors is critical to help increase economic equality in the region. We know how critical um, and also how hard this is. We know that we cannot end all corruption in Central America, but we can make strides to isolate the worst actors, improve the business climate, and guide these governments and societies towards sensible reforms that will lead to better governance and greater prosperity to benefit all Central Americans. We can help provide more opportunities for young Central Americans to build their futures in Central America and to strengthen their communities. But we can only do this if we all work together. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Emily. That is indeed a, a very ambitious plan. It's doable if we have the right actors working together, collaborating towards the same ends. And that is precisely what the Partnership for Central America that Jonathan leads aims at if through delivering long-term solutions consistent with a call of action, bringing public and private sector leaders together to take an active collaborative role. What are the partnership's priorities and achievements so far, Jonathan? Certainly, Marisol, and thank you so much for, for bringing us all together here into the forum, this, uh, the convening of, of a conversation around the topic of, of such significance at this time. In, in short, Marisol, the Partnership for Central America is a coalition of now about 75 uh, multinational corporations and others who are collectively working together to support impact in Central America around a set of seven key objective areas. Emily laid out a number of the strategic focus areas that the U.S. government is prioritizing as we look to the to the U.S. government's strategic uh, focus in the region. Similarly, the Partnership for Central America is structured around a, a set of, of uh, similar priority areas to include manufacturing and support around job creation, to support areas of uh, private potential economic impact, healthcare, education, areas of energy, financial and digital inclusion. And so as we look to some of the areas that the U.S. government is prioritizing, the Partnership for Central America is working to support Vice President Kamala Harris uh, call to action around private sector impact in the region around these seven key areas. Over the last 90 days or so since the Vice President's call to action was issued, 
uh, this coalition of private sector actors have come together with a specific set of outcomes which we've seen deployed in the region. Uh, so far, as we think about the, the direct impact, Microsoft, for example, has begun rolling out uh, programs to support their top line goal of delivering digital inclusion to 4 million households over the next uh, three, four years. Similarly, around financial inclusion, MasterCard and uh, partners in the financial inclusion realm are working to reduce the number of unbanked by 5 million individuals. Uh, we're, we're grateful and, and look forward to hearing from uh, Guillaume Lecomte, CEO of Nespresso, who uh, in partnership with a number of colleagues in the agricultural sector are making significant strides and commitments in this space to view the agriculture sector's specific area of opportunity, deliver impact and improve the livelihoods of individuals in the region. So there, across these seven pillars, uh, Marisol and uh, the Partnership for Central America has brought together a set of private sector, philanthropic, and other civil society actors to deliver against a top line set of goals that aspire to reduce unemployment by 15%, to uh, create 3 million jobs, and to support a target uh, per capita level of 8,000 over these coming 10 years. And so across those top line goals, we're working toward a set of specific outcomes across each of those seven. But I think what Emily noted in the idea of really the, the multi-sectoral approach to this becomes so critical, particularly in this region. The, the partnership as a group of private sector and civil society actors can only be successful if this initiative is driven in a coordinated fashion across all pillars of both private, public, and, uh, and civil society actors. So in that sense, the partnership aspires to continue to grow and to act as a tent to bring together partners across multiple sectors to deliver the inspired income uh, impact that we all uh, hope to achieve in the region. So with that, I'll just thank you very much uh, for the opportunity here and very much looking forward to uh, this conversation. Thank you, Jonathan. All the recent achievements are very impressive. The call of action happened only four months ago. And uh, indeed, those targets are, are quite ambitious. We would love to hear from Guillaume, what is Nespresso's commitment through the Partnership for Central America? And what is that potential transformative impact of these efforts in improving livelihoods, creating jobs, fostering economic development so that people may thrive and rise to the full potential in their own home countries. Guillaume, please. Yeah, thank you, Marisa, and, and thank you for having me. So glad to join this, this conversation. So before you know, talking about commitment, I want to come back to what you know, we started to discuss with John back in April this year, the, you know, trying to find out what kind of commitment we or what kind of contribution we could bring to this uh, effort that we upload, by the way. Uh, it's not that we were starting from scratch. We've been sourcing coffee from Guatemala since more than uh, 2005. So, uh, but but we said there is an opportunity here. We have studies and we conducted studies with uh, uh, our nonprofit partners showing that when you take care of farmers at farm level and you bring the technical assistance and access to market, uh, we found out a 38% decrease in intention to migrate when we do it and we get it right at farm level. So we started from there and talking with Jonathan and said, what, what can we do? And we identified actually three areas where we would like to focus. The first one is expand. You know, we've been, we've been sourcing coffee from Guatemala, not from Honduras and El Salvador, but we committed to double the volumes we're gonna buy from the regions, not only Guatemala where we can open and have new clusters in the, in the region, but also from Honduras. I'm happy to report, and John knows that, that I tested my first Nespresso coffee from Honduras two weeks ago, which tastes amazingly great. So happy to share this great news. It's concrete, it was in the cup. Um, El Salvador is coming soon, hopefully, but expanding the number of farmers we are working with, bringing technical assistance, having more presence on the ground, more agronomists working with farmers on a day-to-day -day basis, and giving access to market. There is no way we can be successful if we work at farm level, but we don't give access to international market to these farmers. In our case, 
being directly connected to end consumers is pretty easy, easy. At least it's feasible to work at farm level and guarantee an access to market for the farmers. The second pillar that goes together with expanding is protecting, protecting and de-risking. We see two risks we need to face here. One, price volatility. We have to protect these farmers from price volatility and you know, worldwide market commodities by guaranteeing a farm gate price. The second one is climate volatility. We have to protect farmers from any risk can be hurricane, I think Salvador, may, you, you mentioned hurricanes, earthquakes, all these, you know, disasters that, you know, have to be taken into account so that farmers will not be hurt, at least trying to, to protect them. So we have um, a crop insurance platform that will guarantee farmers from any risk uh, and guarantee their revenue on their crop, no matter what is happening. Um, and the last pillar we want to focus on is uh, gender equality. We know in the region from the research we had that 88% of women would love, would be keen to be more involved in coffee farming activities, but they don't have access or they don't dare, but there are too many barriers. We need to remove these barriers and give them access to training, access to farming. This is the third uh, pillar. So we are already in action. Uh, we started. We have uh, new farmers coming in the, in, the, in the program. It's starting small and we have to learn, but we are very, very honored and very happy to bring some contribution to this, to this effort. Thank you, Guillaume. As a Salvadoran citizen, I can attest the quality and great taste of Salvadoran coffee. I hope to drink Salvadoran espresso sometime soon. Um, and to your last point, it's a great segue to invite Maria Liliana Moore of Promujer to share their uh, work uh, as civil society and as social entrepreneurs to complement that approach. Uh, that indeed in, in providing access for women into these sectors is, will require a cultural uh, change, uh, which is feasible if we are able to give the right tools and prepare the whole society uh, to enable women into being part of this important agricultural sectors for the region. So Maria Liliana, the role of social entrepreneurs and civil society's active participation and development efforts is indeed key. Promujer's endeavors offering financial health and skills building services specifically for low income women in Latin America have had a very important impact. What are the goals set by Promujer through its commitment with a partnership for Central America? Thank you, Marisol. Thank you, the rest of panelists. We're really happy to be here today. Uh, first of all, yeah, the role of civil society and social entrepreneurs and even community or grassroots organizations is crucial for the Central American Partnership and the work we're gonna do in the Northern Triangle. Why? Uh, and this is super important because they are the ones that know locally what is needed. They know the pain points. They have the connections with local leaders. They really are the ones that can tell us what we need to do. And if we don't work together with them, the plan will fall apart. So I truly believe as Emily and Jonathan say that we should encourage the SDG 17 that is working in multi-sectoral partnerships. So government, private sector, civil society, and even academia. You know, Harvard is part also of the partnership. And it is important to bring the academia on board, but not only academia from the United States, but also what they're discovering in these countries. What are the findings? Um, and what we have done lately in the past four months or five months is we're having one-on-one -on -one conversations and what we call cafecitos virtuales or virtual gatherings with community-based organizations, second level NGOs, uh, universities, and entrepreneurs in the region. So I can give you an example. We have been working closely with Wakami. Wakami is an organization that works in rural areas in Guatemala. And what they're trying is to support women and artisanations and 
coffee growers so that they can connect to international markets and local markets. As Nespresso says, like if you give them the skills, technical skills to run their entrepreneurship ventures, and you give them the tools to increase their agency and decision making is important. But if we not connect them to markets, even in Guatemala, in the North Triangle, in the region and international, everything will fall apart. So we're hearing their needs. For example, we're also talking with CEDES, is a community-based indigenous organization. And they say how you can learn about our culture and our ways of living and our ways of producing, but you can provide us with digital skills. We need digital skills. But as Jonathan said, if we don't bring Microsoft Airband initiative to bring connectivity, so how are we going to connect these women? So you have to be a multi-stakeholder multi approach for this to work. Like we cannot work alone. We have to work in a partnership. And I think that's what the, the Partnership for Central America is trying to do, articulate and coordinate the efforts. And um, talking about promo hair role no, and commitment. So we say like we want to reach 3 million people. And we don't say only women because women are, a multiplier effect in their communities and their families. So why we wanna work not only in financial inclusion that have been one of the most important area of Promujer. Yeah, we wanna provide with this woman with loans. Uh, for example, some of the women are telling us, okay, we're producing um, manufacturing uh, art, art, uh, art craft, but I put it in a market. I put it in, in, in a consignment place but then I have to produce more and I don't have the money to buy that raw material. So I need loans. I need loans to be able to have that raw material and produce more. So that's one case. Other women are telling us uh, we're in debt. After the pandemic, the hurricane eruption in Guatemala, we're, we were not able to do that much. So I need credit lines. We need also the support in technical assistance. Uh, so we have the skills to be able to continue growing. And where you're in debt, they're saying like, we cannot even buy nutritious food. So our kids are malnourished. We're not eating correctly. And our health indicators are bad. Diabetes is rising up. So that's why Promujer brings a holistic approach, not only in financial inclusion, it's bringing health and supporting health specific using technology. We're using telemedicine and chatbots to support uh, women and their families with COVID-related information with chronic disease and even breast cancer screening. So we're combining this approach with what we call skilling or upskilling and reskilling women entrepreneurs so they can really tap um, into the markets and have the, the potential to grow. Thank you, Maria. That is, is really exciting and very necessary, not only in Central America, but uh, in the rest of the region and in the rest of the world kudos for the work you do for providing access to women in these very important fields. Emily, we have heard about this very encouraging commitments from multi-stakeholders leaders. How does this new endeavor differ from past United States cooperation efforts in the region? Thank you for that question, Marisol. Uh, the U.S. government is uh, has been and continues to be committed to Central America. We place a priority on creating economic opportunity, combating corruption, promoting human rights, and improving citizen security in Central America. Um, one thing that's different, the, the Biden-Harris administration has created new pillars in our strategic approach to the region to make it clear that human rights, reducing gender-based violence um, are, are key to our strategy. And all the while, we are staying laser focused on our efforts to combat corruption in these countries. We believe that, that anti-corruption initiatives are um, really a foundational uh, approach to our um, strategic efforts in the region. We are also working to mitigate the impacts of climate change, in part by helping farming communities adapt their agricultural practices to new weather, weather patterns, for example. Uh, we're continually looking for new ways to engage in the region and make progress on our shared goals of a democratic, prosperous, and safe region. Uh, um, and, and I will say that the, this administration is committed at the absolute highest levels to um, a new approach to Central America um, and, one that, uh, and, and one that centers our values. 
ultimately that is a, extremely important and you mentioned climate change. We have been listening to this week's debate at the United Nations where many of the commitments are focused on enhancing cooperation for sustainability. Let's address this global concern in the context of our conversation as well. Uh, Guillaume, the, the coffee industry is not only key for the Central American economies, but for the social and economic welfare of thousands of Central American families employed in this sector. Sustainability and innovation are at the core of Nespresso's DNA, carrying an important potential social and economic transformative power. What are Nespresso's current corporate sustainability priorities? Well, first of all, I just wanted to start with, you know, framing what we mean by sustainability. Uh, years ago, we would look at sustainability as a kind of necessity to, uh, you know, uh, have a, a sustainable supply chain. And year after year, we found out that it's an amazing opportunity for everybody in the value chain, not only uh, for us and, and, you know, driving innovation, but also uh, improving livelihood and sustainability at farm level is, is actually absolutely key to our brand promise. We will never sell any empty castles in the world. We are out of business if the farmers don't stay and, and continue and keep growing coffee. So it's as simple as that. It, it's not only the right thing to do, but it's the only way to be successful uh, as a business moving forward. And I must say, it's a great news. It's a great news that we have to really engage deeply in, uh, in the sustainability topic at farm level if we want to succeed in business. So uh, we've been working now for more than 20 years with, with farmers around the world, more than 100 farmers um, uh, everywhere in the world. It's a day-to-day -day collaboration with farmers. Uh, we, see the, we see the progress, we see the impact. Um, we believe particularly on coffee, we believe and we see coffee as a real force for good. Um, so, and again, it's also, uh, uh, you know, we have to say humble, you know, there are a lot of challenges. It's not going to be an easy task. It's going to be not going to be a, a short term task. It's a, it's a long term journey we're starting in this region as we started in many other regions, but we saw the impact and we saw the potential. Uh, so that's it. Let's start working and, and moving. Thank you, Guillaume. And that is music to our ears. Uh, you know that the multi-stakeholder capitalism concept is at the very core of our work at the World Economic Forum and the creation of a standard set of metrics that is applicable for corporations from different sectors and across geographies is one of the important contributions that the forum is now making into this movement uh, for uh, ESG reporting. And as we have heard, the PCA brings together multi-stakeholder leaders from promoting public and private, but also local and international partnerships. Maria was very clear in also highlighting the importance of this multi-stakeholder appro approach Local leadership is absolutely essential to drive positive change. So let me go back to Salvador and ask him how the Guatemalan private sector is committed to attaining its own responsibilities on environmental sustainability, innovation, and also social inclusion. Salvador, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Marisol. Uh, first of all, uh, within the private sector, we recognize that the current situation is unsustainable, uh, both socially and environmentally. So we must do something about it. And us as Guatemalans are responsible to, to solve our own problems. That said, and to Emily's and Marianiliana's point, we also acknowledge that some of the challenges are too big. So we celebrate the partnership and uh, conversations like this one where you bring different stakeholders to the table to try to find solutions to, to issues that affect uh, both the regions. Uh, that said, in the middle of 2020, within the private sector, we saw both the economic crisis that was upon us, uh, but also the, the opportunity that was unfolding as many of the world's supply chains were being disruptive and how the United States would uh, 
make a push to near sure medical critical services and production capabilities. In this context, our countries are ideally positioned to take advantage of, of the potential opportunity surfacing. Uh, at the time, and, and working together very closely with public entities, the, the Guatemala private sector uh, contracted McKinsey to help us develop a very focused plan to take advantage of this window of opportunity. The idea was not to engage in a very high level, long-term vision type project, but we wanted to have a more concrete, focused short-term plan that could be implemented to attract investment, generate more inclusive jobs, and in a way, restructure our economies. Uh, the result we now call the Guatemala Moving Forward Plan. And within it, there are multiple sectors that have certain advantages that could allow them to increase export and jobs uh, within the short term. But we also know that we have to increase the capabilities, capacities, and move along the value chain to generate higher paying jobs. So we identified a series of sectors where if you were able to bring in investment and te technical capabilities to our countries, we would be able to do that. That's why uh, listening to Guillaume, uh, it's exactly the type of work that we need to, to do in, in order to bring those capabilities locally and, and be able to add value to our products. Among the sectors that were identified, uh, were certain pharmaceuticals, medical devices, electronic manufacturing services, and BPO and programming services. So we definitely need to increase uh, both the, the technical capabilities of, of the people in Guatemala, but also the training capabilities so that we can multiply the, the amount of people that are able to program, speak English, and have some of these uh, competencies that are needed for, for the new higher paying jobs. Uh, we believe this framework can be the basis for an international public-private partnership to accelerate economic growth in our country. Uh, so that's, that's one of the key efforts that the private sector has done. We also recognize that there are multiple other spaces where we can contribute. Uh, one that was mentioned is, is the access to financing to some of the small and growing businesses. So within the group that I work at IDC, we're partnering with USAID and Andy for the launch of an impact investment fund looking to support such uh, small and growing businesses. Uh, one example, one of the companies we're already supporting is Wakami. So I'm very glad to hear from Maria Liliana that, that we have that, that, in, that in, in place. Uh, and I'll just end by mentioning that we also understand that none of these efforts can be sustained if we don't strengthen the capabilities of our government's institutions. Emily mentioned corruption. And we know that we have to contribute, and, and Emily mentioned very well, different ways that the private sector can collaborate. Uh, we have a series of projects in place, such as one to uh, improve the efficiency and the transparency of healthcare procurement. Uh, we are also working together with public and private entities to try to reduce chronic malnutrition, but we know that more must be done to make significant impact and reduce the huge gaps we currently still have in our, in our countries. Thank you. Time. But let's have a final take from each one of you, one minute each, please. Let's begin with you, Jonathan. Uh, how can other companies and organizations adhere to Vice President Hamala Harris's effort? John, I think you're muted. If you couldn't mute yourself. Thank you. My apologies. The overused word of uh, 2021. So, uh, just it, very briefly noting the time, uh, Marisol, well thank you and thank you to everyone again for the, this gathering. Uh, in short order, I think the, the question of how to get involved and how to support the Vice President's uh, call to action around private sector impact in the region. The partnership, very aptly named, really intends to be that attempt to gather partners, uh, organizations across civil society to have the impact. So just in very short order, what I will say is that we have a set of events coming up uh, hosted by the Vice President as well as our colleagues across the U.S. government that intend to bring together additional partners to support this effort. Uh, Nespresso and, uh, and Guillaume uh, leading the, that and the, the Vice President's efforts around agriculture uh, have already brought together as an example of this uh, partners across the sectors, including Bayer, Cargill, 
and others to support a collective and coordinated approach to agriculture and regenerative agricultural strategies. So in using that as an example of Guillaume's leadership and driving that in support of the Vice President initiative, that's an example where replicating that model and to bring other partners in for these efforts to include the digital inclusion, financial inclusion, and other pillars. So I'll, I'll just say as we move ahead, we look forward to bringing additional partners and, uh, and development in Central America. So thanks very much for this, uh, this opportunity. Thank you, Jonathan. Guillaume, and from your personal and corporate engagement, what message can you share with other international companies considering to join efforts aligned with Vice President Harry's initiative? Yeah, um, you know, as I said, it's going to be um, a long journey. Uh, we, we need to be ready for that. We need to, we need to start acting now on what, where we can act and measure the impact on a day-to-day -day basis. That's what we can do now as Nespresso. But as John was mentioning, we see a much broader potential if we go beyond coffee, beyond you know one brand. It's it's a partnership. So by expanding the partnership, we assess the potential of you know improving prosperity of about 1.5 million people in the region. That's what we aim for. And obviously, there is not a chance to achieve this by ourselves or alone. We really need to bring all efforts, all willingness to contribute in the table. And, and I think the fact that it's led by the vice president uh, is a unique opportunity. Uh, and we have to leverage this force uh, if we want to achieve on our, on our goal, which is, again, about one and a half million people we can, we can help. Thank you very much. Those efforts are highly appreciated. Emily, and beyond the pledged financial resources of four billion U.S. dollars to support this very ambitious plan, the attainment of the initiative's objectives will definitely require broad, ongoing support for the long term. What are the key components for the continuation of these efforts, and how will the required support be ensured? Thank you so much. Um, and, and thank you for this space and this forum to have this very important discussion. As I said, there is a commitment at the highest levels of the US government to approach Central America strategically um, and to do so with resources, with diplomatic engagement, with sustained engagement with important stakeholders, several of whom are on this this converse, are part of this conversation today. Our goal in Central America is as a democratic, prosperous and secure Central America um, to promote that through every um, every tool available with the U.S. government and working alongside important stakeholders. Our, um, our foreign assistance and our diplomatic engagement is but one tool to affect this goal. Uh, and we, it, we will necessarily continue to partner with private sector actors, civil society, non-governmental organizations, um, the people of Central America. And, uh, and I think working together on the strategic approach that we have all outlined and come uh, and, and and come around together, we're unified in our vision. Uh, we can we can achieve these goals. Absolutely, thank you. That's very encouraging. Thank you, Emily, and Maria Liliana. If from from her perspective, what aspects can be enhanced to create that enabling environment to assist? NGOs and social entrepreneurs in the attainment of the partnerships goals? So first, um, private sector and official aid coordinated efforts and providing funding, direct funding to these organizations that are in the field, that are in the front line. That would be the first one. And I think something that is important and I did it cover in my last intervention is gender lens investing and gender based uh, violence prevention. So Promujer is working in a fund, it's called the ELO Women's Empowerment Fund, and we're advising companies and investors of how to include gender lens strategies and gender equality in their inv in the, uh, investments. Um, we have some of, some of those companies are located, for example, in Guatemala and in Honduras. And the second one is about gender-based violence, uh, Guatemala, 159 femicides and more than 20,000 complaints of gender-based violence in 2021. 
So we have been creating, and we did it in Bolivia, a hotline, a helpline for women that have been really successful. And we want to take that also to the Northern Triangle with that experience and take the best practices because that's needed. If we don't work in the mental health and well-being of these women, they will not be able to do the other things and invest in their entrepreneurship ventures. So I will say that that will be really important too. Yes, absolutely. A systemic approach on that a very important challenge of a, not reducing, but a, really finishing with gender-based violence is, is key and intergenerational efforts are also necessary so that this a cultural habits do not transcend generations. So that is going to be a very, very valuable effort, Maria Liliana. And finally, Salvador, very, very short, because we have already exceeded our time. Uh, but uh, from your perspective, as a Central American visionary and responsible leader, what do you think are the top priorities to create opportunities for Central Americans to drive positive transformation in our region? Thank you, Marisol. Very quickly, three priorities. First, we need to improve our infrastructure. Uh, we have very weak infrastructure systems, and if we don't have better infrastructure, uh, it won't be possible to attract investment and be competitive to, to generate uh, economic growth and additional jobs. Second, we need more digitalization and innovation. Uh, we just simply cannot use legacy solutions that will take generations to close some of the existing economic and social gaps. We need disruptive technical solutions that can leapfrog current situations and accelerate the speed of change. And, and we must incorporate our economies uh, into the emerging technological sectors to be able to include more people in the different parts of, of the systems. And lastly, we need a fair and functional justice system. Uh, we must combat corruption. And if we expect to have uh, political governments that work, if we are going to attract investment and generate inclusive economic growth, our justice system must work. So I would focus on those three things and, and leverage the capacities of the different stakeholders in this call to, to be able to implement such, such changes. Thank you. Thank you, Salvador, always on point. And thank you all very much for these very valuable and inspiring contributions. We look forward to continue to collaborate in building resilient and sustainable economies with the aspiration of creating enabling environments in Central America that will allow its citizens to find opportunities and thrive in their own countries rather than being forced to leave. Visible change and concrete positive impact will restore trust and will bring back hope. Thank you very much. Thank you for all your contributions.